Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see all of you here. Some of the faces here I know, um, some and some faces I don't, but I'm just glad to be here with you guys tonight. Um, I want you to know that this topic, we've done a lot of mental health, different mental health talks, and this topic in particular is so very personal because um, fear is part of being human, right? The experience of fear. And so I'm gonna share more of my story a little bit later on in the presentation, just so you kind of know what my experience has been because it's extensive when we talk about fear. So again, I'm just really glad you're here tonight. Um, a couple of things to know, this is what we'll be talking about, um, <clears throat> kind of the order of things so you know what's next, because if any of us are fearful, we like to know what's coming next, right? <laughs> Anyone can attest for that? What's the agenda? What's gonna be? What's going to be coming around the corner, right? Don't we wish we, we knew that? Um, I want to remind everyone tonight that what, we're, what I am talking about tonight um, is not actual advice, okay? So this is informational and educational. And the reason I say that is because very likely I don't know your actual personal story. So this doesn't take the place of advice from your doctor or your therapist. They know what's going on in your life. I probably don't. So again, hopefully this is just educational and, and hopefully just in really encouraging to you tonight. All right. All right. So about me, um, there's me again. Um, so again, I'm a, a licensed mental health counselor. I've been a therapist for almost 15 years now. My company is Hope Christian Counseling. I started that in 2010. And so it is private practice. And that's really the context that I love to work in um, because you can just focus on meeting with clients and, and getting to know their stories. Being a therapist is such privileged work because you're getting to know people's story and be a part of their life in a really, really intimate way. And I know I tell people a lot, it's not a party, I know that. You know, I'm not a party planner. So when they come in to see me, I understand it's deep and it's painful at times and hopefully really encouraging at times too. The reason I named my company Hope Christian Counseling is because I believe there's hope. You know, there is hope because we have the Lord. That's why there is hope, right? So um, I was actually, I came to the Lord, came to accept the Lord at about uh, 25 years old. So, um, I had a whole a good number of years, at least before that, where I was wandering in darkness, basically, and uh, without a compass. So my life changed significantly after coming to the Lord. And so again, I'll put some of those pieces together as we get further on into things. But um, the Proclaim Church mention, mention is my husband uh, is a, a pastor at, Pro, at is our pastor at Proclaim Church, and so he may join us later on tonight too. He may sneak in here to see me, so that's good. Um, so him and our little daughter, we have a little toddler, so he's putting her to bed at home. Um, so I, any of you ever heard of Dan Allender? He's a Christian psychologist. Okay, so anyways, if you really want to go deep, get one of his books. Dan Allender is so deep. Anyone know about him? Anyone at all? Okay, good. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. He gets to the heart of the matter, okay, on things. So I loved this quote from him talking about fear. And this book in, that this comes from is a beautiful book talking about our emotions and, and that, the connection, you know, with the Lord, what's really going on for us. So the absence of tumult more than its presence is an enemy of the soul. God meets you in your weakness, not in your strength. He comforts those who mourn, not those who live above desperation. He reveals himself more often in darkness than in the happy, happy moments of life. Isn't that like such good news and such crappy news? <laughs> right? I know. I know that. And I think that's what I wrestle with every day with clients, you know, and in my own life too, right? That is the reality of the world that we live in. You know, the Lord is so, um, he tells us he's so close to the brokenhearted. And hey, when you're joyful too, the Lord is not distant. He's with you in that as well, right? Joy comes from him. But at the same time, there is a special, just like Laura referenced, there is a special intimacy that happens when we are in the middle of suffering. And any of you in here, you know, who, who know the Lord probably know that. And it's like, I hate it. I know it and I hate it. And I'm so grateful for it and love it at the same time because pain 
is really hard to go through. And we're gonna be talking a lot about pain tonight. So um, thank God for all these nice festive decorations because hope maybe it'll balance it out a little bit, right? I know, and of course we have Casey with the awesome sweatshirt, so <laughs> there we go, we have some levity here. Um, all right, so anyways, I thought this quote though really kind of set the tone because this is, again, the reality we live in. So when we're talking about fear as well, God is in that experience of fear with us. I'm going to talk just a little bit clinically about fear versus anxiety, but I really want to tell you guys that it's, it's pretty intertwined. And something I had read on, on just um, different websites about the experience of fear and anxiety is when you're actually experiencing it, you're not really concerned. Is this fear or is this anxiety, right? It's pre it's, they're pretty closely related, right? So, and they're not very fun, basically, to deal with. So fear tends to be this is not necessarily the experience perfectly described for everyone, but fear tends to be specific, okay? It's an observable danger that we can see, usually, that when we're talking about fear. That um, fear is related to an anxiety attached to a specific thing or a circumstance. It makes people run for cover. That's that fight or flight response. Or, of course, they may freeze in terror. Okay, so fight or flight is not the only response. We have the freeze, and there's also even a fawn response where you almost go, you know, it's like a dog that puts the belly up, right, and just like submits, right, and want to make people happy um, because you're afraid. When, when we, uh, we can become self-focused and on high alert with an extensive experience of fear. So let's acknowledge, though, too, fear is, is really in its, I, I would say, not dysfunctional form, right? It's given to us as a gift. We need to experience fear. There are things to actually be afraid of, and they, they give us a pause, you know, that we should be cautioned. We should have caution. We should be careful. We should back up from the edge of the cliff, right? Don't take the selfies on the, the side of the Grand Canyon, you know? Go to the place where there's actually a fence, things like that. There's a reason for fear to come. So we're not, the goal would not be to eliminate all fear because, again, fear is a natural instinct that is given to us that actually can be protective. It's when it gets, as I think we can all acknowledge, when it goes overboard and becomes dysfunctional and rules your life and you you end up being afraid of things that are actually not life-threatening. That's when it's disruptive. That's when it's stealing your joy, and we'll unpack more of that. So anxiety looks, can look a little different, so it's more unfocused, can be object, objectless, future-oriented. What if this happens? What if that happens? There's a lot of anticipation about what could be coming next. Um, I won't make you raise your hand, but gosh, if any of you in here experience anxiety, is it not the worst? Like anxiety is so uncomfortable and can be so terrible, and especially when we're talking even into the realm of panic attacks, anxiety is just a, so painful to deal with. I know that, and and it, there's varying levels. You know, there's sometimes mild anxiety that's situational, like maybe tied with one or two things, and there's some people that experience like a chronic you know, anxiety where you're just anxious all the time and you can't even necessarily pinpoint the why. Um, anxiety doesn't necessarily require a triggering, triggering stimulus. That's that vague nature about anxiety. Again, it's that anticipation of a threat. What if this? What if that? Um, can result in becoming chronically vigilant for potential threats. So that's kind of a, a little bit of the difference with fear and anxiety, but again, they're pretty closely related. So when you're experiencing them, I, I'm not sure that we're, you're worrying about pulling those two things apart. And I'll, again, I will probably, I'll use the term fear tonight more often, but if I talk about anxiety, it's a little bit interchangeable. So the effects on our bodies, okay? This is the physical experience. And again, some of you may be sitting here saying, yeah, yes, I've had this all day long. I know that this experience, you know, because anxiety may be something that, you that you're dealing with. So again, over here, uh, fear, quick, shallow breathing, shortness of breath, hot flashes or chills, rapid heartbeat. Again, a lot of this actually too is, if you think about it, is survival. You know, because of that very instinctual reaction of fear, you know, there's a survival mechanism to that. It's getting you ready to be able to move away from the bear, you know, that kind of a thing. But how uncomfortable is this when this is happening, when there's not an actual you know, life-threatening situation that you're having to run from, but your body is experiencing everything as if it were. Then we have anxiety, again, similar 
feeling detached, trembling and shaking, sweating, tightness in the chest, upset stomach, rapid heartbeat, inability to focus, racing thoughts, constant worry, catastrophizing, that means like thinking like everything's gonna go wrong, <clears throat> irritability, fatigue, anxiety is exhausting, right? Even a burst of fear can be tiring. Have you ever noticed that too? If you had like a sudden scare where you feel really tired after that, because you know, because all the adrenaline was, was going, you know, to get you through that. All right, so we're going to transition. So that was, again, anxiety, fear, because I, I know some people may be wondering, again, what the difference is. Um, I'm going to go in, in a direction of, I'm going to focus on two different things that I feel like really feed our fear, and especially, especially the dysfunctional, you know, fear patterns that we may have. And one of these that I'm going to talk about tonight is expectations. And I'm going to break this down more for us, okay? When we hold tightly to our expectations about how things must be or how things must turn out for us to trust or have faith or be okay, we add to our fear. Because in this case, we have no choice but to try to control all our life circumstances, including other people, since things must turn out in a certain way. Does anyone relate with this? You don't have to raise your hand, but in case you want to. I think we, right? I know. I think we can all relate with this. This is really hard. It's really, really hard to, re when we actually recognize how out of control we really are in this world, right? In the fallen world that we are in, it can be so scary. But I think what ends up happening when we have these expectations that things must be a certain way, right? And there's a lot of reasons we get like this. Okay, and this can be a lot of growing up stuff, and we're gonna talk about trauma a little bit later, but there's a lot of reasons we get that way, but I, and then sometimes the more we've, we've been through, the more hard things we've been through, sometimes we can notice that holding on more tightly or being very rigid, again, that this must turn out this way, I must be cured, you know, things like that. You know, we can get into some really deep, scary stuff here in life to where we will hold on and feel like things must turn out a certain way for everything to be okay. But the reality is what ends up happening when we're locked in like that is that, that it just feeds the fear and it continues the same fear cycle. Ironically, the freedom is found in fully surrendering over and over and over again throughout life. Um, one of the things that I know I've spent, oh boy, so much time in my mind um, wrestling myself down to is like, okay, I need to release this and be okay if this happens and that happens. The future forecasting and trying to surrender things that haven't even happened is, I don't think that's very helpful, just so you know, because it's not even a reality that we even know is going to happen. The, what we need to surrender is what we have going on in the present. Right? Because that is the reality of what's actually going on. I heard this beautiful explanation one time of, of when we forecast to the future, right? And we talk, uh, think about all the what ifs, all the terrible worst case scenarios that can, could occur in our lives. Um, that the Lord is not actually in those things because it's simply our imagination. So his grace is not there with us in that. His grace is in the present and what actually is happening now. That's where the surrender needs to happen not in the future what ifs because we're not there we don't know if that's even going to happen we don't know how long we're going to be on this earth for so i don't know how i think it's a waste of your waste of your time and i've spent time doing it okay i need to be okay if this happens and that happens lord and i don't know and can i how about this and can i trust you with that? all the things right and it's like at the end of the day what am i actually trying to do i'm just trying to control I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. If I think of all the possible worst case scenarios, then somehow I have more control than, than I feel like I do. Anyone ever feel like that? If I think of all the possible worst case scenarios, right? I'm like, I to I've told my husband before, I think I'd be a great risk manager for like another, like that could be my like, other career that I'm gonna do, my, <laughs> my third career. My first one was HR before I became a therapist. So I'm gonna do, be risk a risk manager. Anyways, <laughs> <sighs> Any so it doesn't, it doesn't work. I think where the Lord wants us to surrender is when we're talking about reality. Please understand as I say these things too, that my, it, my intention is not to try to oversimplify. I understand that some of you may be sitting here with some scenarios, so to speak, meaning your life, that where it's like, how in the world will I ever be able to surrender 
this situation that I'm going through, right? Or if this situation doesn't turn out okay, if my loved one's not okay, how am I going to be okay? So I know that this is not simple and this is probably not gonna be fixed in one night or any of those things, but I really want to give you these things to consider, you know, to consider and wrestle with. That, um, side note, that's the parking garage above us. <laughs> yes, I see a lot of people looking around like, what is that? That's the parking garage, so. That's, a little, that's the sound we have. And Laura and I were laughing, talking about, we need a funny thing to break up all the intensity of this night, and there we go. So hopefully all the, the cars will stay up there and not down here, and we'll be good. Just kidding, just kidding. I know, right? Which one are we talking about there? That's a very concrete thing, literally. Okay, so we have, I'm going to um, talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So um, some of you may know this story from the Bible. Um, and it, in, in preparation for tonight, I really, um, this story kept coming up again and again in my mind because <clears throat> some of you may already know how this, how this goes down, but basically these guys were um, part of the King, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, right? They were considered, what were they considered? Some of the Hebrew men, right? Hebrew men that, that served King Nebuchadnezzar, basically. And so... These guys, though, knew God, had faith in the Lord, trusted him, right? They were not going to bow down to a king. King Nebuchadnezzar had made an edict that he made a gold statue, and he would, everyone in the kingdom was supposed to bow down to this gold statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone here you can see in the kingdom is bowing down. These guys are not. So here um, in Daniel 3.16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, this is to the king, and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we see, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Because basically, if they didn't bow down, they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So what kept sticking out to me was, be, oh, hold on a second, but if not, right there, right? And some of the translations say, even, <clears throat> basically, even if, even if he doesn't save us, we're not bowing down to you. And this is, to me, was such a picture of surrender, right? such a picture of surrender, which almost can't even be explained, to, in my opinion, in human terms. I'm not sure that we're capable of surrender under a situation like this, when they're literally about to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And they're like, listen, our God can do it, but even if he doesn't, we're not changing anything. We're not bowing down to you. Like, you can't scare us. You can't scare us because we have, our God's bigger than all this. So, Again, what, what a picture, right, of, that, of surrender to the Lord's will. So then what happens, right? Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did, this is, they, so they were thrown into the fire, by the way. They didn't bow down. So here we are. Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So some of you guys may already know, right? This was um, what scholars believe was this was Jesus walking with them, a, a theophany, a Christophany, you know, before he had actually come to the earth, here walking with them in the midst of the fire, right? And what a reminder, because this is consistent with scripture, that he is with us in the fire, <laughs> in the flood, right? Whatever it is that we are going through, he is in the midst of it with us. So again, this, I think that the, the reason, again, for this talk that that resonated so much with me, this story, was just that surrender, that, um, that your will be done, not my will, but your will, Lord, be done. That is one of the ways in which we can find our freedom and peace is that consistent surrender. Not for all the possible what ifs, because we don't have any control of that, but for what is presently going on right now. <clears throat> Perfect surrender, right? Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, um, right before he was going to be crucified. 
and he was praying here. So he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. If we want to look at perfect surrender, right? Because Jesus was perfect without sin. Here we are right now in perfect union always with the Father. And so <clears throat> even our Lord knew what it meant, though, to surrender. To surrender, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. Um, I was also struck by this, and I'll, I, I have another song actually in here that I'm going to share with you. I should just play it, but some of you probably already know this song, the Even If Song by Mercy Me. I don't know all their songs, but this song in particular sticks out to me. And I actually saw um, them play this song at a conference I went to like three or four years back. So he told, the lead singer told the story of the song. Have any of you ever heard it before? Yeah. <laughs> the story of the song, right? So hopefully I'll retell it well. So he, his son is diabetic, and um, they were taking his son, I think he's 12 or 13, at that time, was like 12 or 13 or something. They were taking him to a doctor's appointment. They saw a woman from their church outside of the doctor's office, and she came up and said, hey, what are you guys doing here? Oh, we're taking our son. He has diabetes. Oh, he has diabetes. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe that. We've got to pray right now that the Lord heals him. You know, and so, and I, his response basically was, as if we haven't done that. And it wasn't because she, this woman did anything wrong, taking all of our needs to the Lord, hoping for healing, right? Praying consistently, keeping that hope up, not nonstop, you know, praying for healing. You know, we have, we serve, our Lord is our healer. He's the, he is the great physician. Um, however, I think what he was trying to say is basically the Lord hasn't chosen to heal yet. And here we are, and we're going to, we're trying to walk this out. And so that's where the lyrics of this song came from. You know, so even if, Lord, so this is just, by the way, this is not the whole song. This is just, you know, a few lines. But I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow. I know the hurt would just go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. And again, what, what I am so encouraged by, re, by hearing stories like this, by reading Verses like this by hearing this song is a great song too, right? Just the message of that of like just like that acknowledgement of God, you are God, and I know you can. But even if you don't, I'm still gonna trust and follow. This is hard stuff, though, isn't it? Because I know for some of you, this is so personal tonight, especially because you may be going through something right now that you don't want to surrender, that you don't want to see this go a different way. So I, I I know that, and so I know this isn't easy, but I hope that you're that you're encouraged to consider. So <clears throat> how do we find that freedom, right? How do we surrender? We need to acknowledge, how do we surrender an expectation that's in the way of us trusting and that is feeding our fear? We need to acknowledge that the expectation is there. We need to name it, right? It's really hard to get through or over something if we never name it. So acknowledging the expectation is there. We need to express the expectation and what we feel about it. We need to acknowledge our feelings. Imagine that. If anyone ever tells you that you're not supposed to, supposed to acknowledge your feelings, I'm sorry, that's so wrong. The Bible gives us a whole book if we need a reminder of the Psalms of all kinds of feelings, right? So express the expectation, what we feel about it. We may need to grieve the loss of the expectation. There's sometimes for some of you who may have a picture in your mind that this is what my life was supposed to look like and it doesn't look like this. And what am I supposed to do about that? Where are you, Lord? Right? Where are you, Lord? But ironically, in the consideration to let go of that picture, and I can't, no one can tell you to do that. This is so personal, you know? Some of you, this may be what you need to do, but I, no one can sit here and tell you, you better do this. You know, but if you feel like this is what you need to get, do, you may need to grieve that picture of like the fact that it didn't turn out that way, that I didn't get the husband I wanted, or I didn't have kids, or I didn't, or this person didn't survive this, or I'm still sick, or I didn't get the job, or whatever it is, right? It's so personal to you. But I think the grieving is really, really important. How about, um, we don't have to do it alone. We don't have to do this alone. We can ask for help. In any of this, in all of this, you can ask for help. You don't have to do it alone. 
All right, so <clears throat> much lighter topic. We're going to switch gears. <laughs> I, it's like, how much deeper can we get in here, right? So now we're going to talk about trauma and, and its effects that, you know, on fear. Trauma is any experience we have which overwhelms our ability to cope, all right? There are, by the way, there are multiple definitions, and there's several therapists in here as well. So you may talk to each one of us and hear a different explanation for what trauma is, but this is, I think, a really simple explanation that resonated with me, okay? So our experience of trauma leaves us with deeply false beliefs about ourselves in addition to all the other effects. There's so many effects that trauma have on us. And so, but one of the things I'm, I'm, what I'm going to be focusing on is those deeply false beliefs about ourselves. Unless we become aware of these beliefs, realize we have been deeply wounded, seek out healing, ask for help, we will likely continue to live out these false beliefs because you may simply be unaware. Some of it you know, some of it you may not know. And I want to do like 15 different like disclaimers in regards to trauma, by the way. You likely need support when you're working through tra some traumatic stuff, okay? I don't want you to go it alone, and especially if it feels overwhelming, just to even put your finger into that water, okay? Don't pl plow through this. Like, it's okay, I got this, I should be able to look at all this. And, and the goal, and I put it on some other slide, but we'll get there, is not to relive the trauma. That's not going to help you. As therapists, we're not trying to get you to relive it. We want to help you process it in a way that is not going to be as much as possible, that is not going to be re-triggering and reliving it and pretending that it's all happening again. That's not going to probably be helpful for you. So don't go it alone. I want to share this verse with you, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about my story right here. But this is, but you, O Lord, because this is the verse of the Lord gave me, are a shield about me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. So... Um, when I was about four years old, I was sexually abused my, by my uncle, who was a teenager at the time. And so I told my parents that it happened. My grandmother had been watching us um, when it happened, and she didn't, I don't, she didn't literally, she didn't see it happen, but she was supposed to be watching us. My parents weren't there. So told my parents, my grandmother denied it, my uncle denied it. And so my parents thought, oh, maybe she saw something on TV. It didn't happen, you know, that kind of thing. So, by the way, I've had lots and lots of conversations with my parents subsequently, and so there's peace and there's love and there's acknowledgement. And my mom says that she, there's not a day that goes by that she doesn't remember that this is how it went down and what happened afterwards. So, any which way, but she is, she's forgiven and loved. So, it wasn't intentional. They didn't mean harm by handling it this way. But needless to say, my trauma was not dealt with, so I was a very traumatized little girl. So subsequently, I was fearful, as you can imagine, a little person to be. We lived in California. I was afraid of earthquakes. I slept with one eye open every night, waiting for the walls to start shaking for earthquakes. We moved to Georgia. So I, was, I got a weather radio. I was listening to the weather radio on a daily basis, watching the weather channel, monitoring all the weather to see if tornadoes and or what was going to happen there because I'd never been around thunderstorms because California has nothing going on. Not really. But it was all earthquakes, moved over there to tornadoes and, and so on and so forth. And it was glass elevators and, and all kinds of things. And so I was hyper vigilant. My whole system, if any of you know about trauma, was activated. I was anxious. I was so nervous. I was made fun of at school. It was like compiling one thing on top of the other, on top of the other. I fit in, felt, it felt what felt like nowhere, you know? And so it was rough. It was really rough. And I think my parents tried to compensate, enabled all of these, you know, different things. And so they were trying to constantly kind of rescue me and, oh, she has self-esteem issues and this and this and that. And, you know, they were just trying their best without having ever dealt with their own trauma. So years, years later, I'm 46 now and, and you know, have gone through, you know, I'm know the Lord now, right? So my life is totally different. I've gone through a lot of therapy and am a therapist and all the things, right? So in the last four or five years, probably five years in particular, I have started to understand more and more and more about my trauma and like piecing all these things together. And then in one of my own therapy sessions where I was going through therapy, this is what the Lord gave me and pointing out to me like the reason, because one of the things now that really gets me is flying. 
I love traveling and I will fly and I do and I push myself because I don't want fear to stop me but let me tell you it's an ordeal you know um, because it triggers all the old stuff it triggers all the old stuff and the, that old that old belief was I am alone you know because basically if trauma is not addressed when you're a child and you go through it what you do learn is that you are alone and so that's why my fear and control went into overdrive because that's what I instinctually felt like I had to do was handle the whole world. So the Lord pointed out to me that basically the reason you're feeling all this fear is because you are projecting onto me, you know, like at basic, like I'm your parents, but I'm not your parents. Like I'm, I'm God, I'm your father in heaven. I have you, I am with you. I right here in the shield around you. And when you look up this verse, by the way, like more of the behind the, like the trend, um, breaking down the original language, this is a shield all the way around you. This is not just a, like a nice little shield in front of you. This is surrounding you. That's the Lord, the lifter of your head. He will take away the shame and lift up your head. And that's what he has done for me. You know, for me standing here, doing any of these talks, being a therapist, all of those things. Uh, let me tell you from where I came from, the little girl who had no voice and who was afraid to speak and would mumble, you know, because I had so much anxiety, you know, I just look at it like, oh my goodness, Lord, you knew what you were doing, right? So any which way, that's the verse that he gave me. So um, I hope you're encouraged by that. So that's what I'm saying, I understand fear. And hey, shout out because my best friend just walked in. <laughs> my husband walked in. Okay, so it is well with my soul. How many of you know this hymn? Mm -hmm. Have heard this hymn, right? Oh, isn't it so beautiful? It's such a beautiful hymn, right? The, yeah. Oh, there we go. So you know. So this is not, again, not all the lyrics, but just a little passage right here. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. I looked this up, if you, any, any of you have ever looked up the story right here, right? This man, Horatio right here, lost everything in the 1871 fire, I think in Chicago, he was a wealthy businessman. He thought his kids and his wife needed a good vacation, they'd been through so much, sail over to England, the boat gets into trouble, starts to sink. He loses all four of his daughters. His wife survives, sends a telegram when she gets to England, like, hey, I'm alone now. What should we do? He heads over. The captain of the ship he's on, when they get to the area where the boat head sank, um, tells him, hey, this is, we're over this area. And that's when he penned this hymn. And the reason I'm sharing this with you right now is because in our times of deepest suffering, the Lord is there and that's what I'm talking about because the only way to explain for someone to be able to write words like that are in this hymn right is the Lord I, I, I can't there's no human explanation for that it is well with my soul right so all right I want to get into a, a Bible story Peter's denial we know when Peter denied Christ right three times three times. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of this, but most of you, I think, know this story that three times he denied Christ, right? And Jesus said that he was going to do it. And Peter said, no way. I love you, Lord. I'll never deny you, right? But he, but he did. So, and what happened at the end here, right? Um, he went out and wept bitterly. Think of what a story of trauma this is, okay? The scripture doesn't say this is trauma, but I'm, just think of this story, and is it not trauma? You know, he just saw Jesus, right, get arrested. He's starting to get tortured. He's, going, he's headed to the cross, right? And then he gets approached, because, and he's going to get in trouble next if he says, he's going to get arrested next too if he says that he even knows Jesus. Then he denies the one he loves, his Savior, you know, three times, and everything happens like Jesus said it was going to. So here's the beautiful thing. We've talked about things happening to us, which are trauma. How about the things that we do? That end up leaving us traumatized and here's how the Lord meets him in that right he is resurrected come back comes back hat and has this conversation with Peter when they had finished breakfast Jesus said to Simon Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these he said to him yes Lord you know that I love you 
He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. If you look and do some more study on these verses, there's a, there seems to be a really significant impact with the way in which the Lord addresses Peter, how he calls him, his names on each of the three times that he asks him this question. So look at what he's doing, right? He is lifting his head out of the pit. He's taking the shame away because what does he tell Peter next? What comes next? Does anybody know? pastors in the room. Isn't this what he says? I'm going to like build my church, you know, like go. He brings him back. He takes him out, right? He's okay, maybe I'm wrong, but it, that is what happens though, uh, <laughs> right? So think, think of what he has for Peter though next, right? And so he is, for, he is, you are forgiven, Peter. You are forgiven. I love you. You may have done what seemed like the worst thing ever, but you don't have to be in shame. It is done and finished. And that is what the Lord has for all of us here. Isn't that the good news, yeah. right? So those traumatic experiences, whether it's something that happened to us or whether it's something that we did, the Lord speaks truth over us and wants to heal us from those things. And some of this is lifelong, you guys. This is, we don't necessarily arrive at a point where it's all done and there's no eraser. I don't know about any, you know, a delete button, a magic life delete button or anything, right? Like this is lifelong and I think the Lord takes us to different levels of healing and understanding and so forth. But look at the beauty of God's love for Peter in this. <clears throat> Time. I'm, I don't want, I'm, don't want to rush, but at the same time, too, I'm going to short, any thoughts? Just hurry up. It feels like you're talking about Jesus. Huh? It feels like how much you want to do for Yeah, I got it. Okay. So, um, let me think for a second here. So, I'm going to go quickly through this part. So, understanding more about your story. First, your attitude toward yourself needs to be one of self-compassion and kindness. If you're going to try to go back and understand more about your story, you may have done a lot of work on your story, by the way. But if you haven't, or if you feel like there's still other stuff going on there for you, please approach yourself with compassion and kindness and not criticism because it's not going to change a thing. Mm -hmm. In fact, we lock up more when we're like that toward ourselves. Fear that feels out of control is likely tied in with your life experiences and particularly trauma. Consider reflecting on some life events that were impactful to you. Again, you don't have to do this alone. Um, if it's overwhelming, please don't do it alone. The goal is not to relive the trauma, like I said. We did those, what did those life events say about life in general or, or about you specifically, right? It's all my fault, it's always my fault. Or for me, remember I told you like it's I'm alone. So then everything would go back to I'm alone, that kind of thing. What beliefs about the world or yourself are getting in the way of seeing God for who he is, the promises he has made to you? Another way to ask it is, how is what I've been going through informing my fear or feeding it? We can't do this if we don't face our stories, though, if we don't reflect and pray through what has happened to us, if we don't face the areas where we are still refusing to trust God and what he said. Some of us are determined to continue to believe lies and to continue to let hurt dictate our present and future. Sometimes this is unconscious though. And I also want to put, I almost put like 20 asterisks here, but, 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 okay. For some of you, especially with experiences of trauma, good can feel like bad and it's all mixed up. And if you've experienced spiritual abuse, this can get even more complicated. So please know I understand that. And so I would, I encourage you to be sensitive with yourself and sensitive in the getting help. This is not over, I don't intend this to be overly simplistic. Just get over it, face your stuff, move on, believe what the Lord said, all those things, right? If it were only that easy. But it's not always that easy. And that's why it's important to work with someone individually that knows your story, right? So, all right, trust. You want to know what the antidote to fear is, by the way. The big secret tonight, it's, it really is trust. Elizabeth Elliot. Anybody know who that is? 
All right, so um, a lot of you probably know that her um, husband was uh, on a missions trip and was killed by the indigenous people. I think it was in Ecuador, was it? Does anyone remember? Yeah, Ecuador. So needless to say, she went through a lot of trauma and actually returned to that same village. And um, a lot of the people there, my recollection of the story is that they ended up coming to the Lord as well. This, she knows suffering. So whatever it is in the cup that God is offering to me, whether it be pain and sorrow and suffering and grief, along with the many more joys, I am willing to take it because I trust him. The Lord, right? Oh, what can we point to here but just the Lord? Courage isn't the antidote to anxiety. Trust is. If a relationship does not have trust, is there really a relationship? Right? And we all know that for marriages and so forth, especially you therapists in here, you know this, right? If there's no trust, like what are you guys doing, right? But, but think about how often we don't necessarily think about it in, in that in terms of our relationship with the Lord. And that, please understand, I'm not saying like, ooh, that's a sign that you don't know the Lord and you're not saved. That's not, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm t but I am talking about if there are areas where you have a block and you don't believe God and you don't trust him and you're still seeing God as your earthly dad who was abusive, it's things like that that we need to go to the Lord and ask for healing Please, Lord, help me to see you as you tell me you are, not as my earthly dad was, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your, um, straight your paths, right? It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Flesh can do about just about anything, but they can't take your, you away from the Lord's hands. Mm -hmm. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting, everlasting rock. Um, one thing I want to clarify too, and I think Laura had already said it too, when we fear, when we struggle with this topic here, right, this is not an indicator that you're not trusting the Lord. I think it's, I think it's multifaceted right? Just like I was sharing with my own story and Laura shared with her story and so forth. There's a lot of components to it. But man, if we work on and pray on, Lord, I want to trust you more and more. Show me more of you. Help me to do that, right? I think it would be a beneficial prayer. Okay, take a picture of this, right? Just a few of God's promises. And these are only from like, by the way, this is like Isaiah 41 and then just a few like Romans and so forth over here. Not the many thousands that are actually in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> like this is just a touch of it. But what I was struck by in these is how many of these speak to the, the false messages, the negative messages that are given to us through traumatic experiences right? I'm rejected. I'm alone. I'm no good. All those things. The Lord speaks against all of that. Okay. I want to change slides. Okay. So next steps, reflect, pray, consider what we talked about tonight. What is the Lord telling you personally? Do you need to talk with someone more about it? A close friend, pastor, a therapist, reaching out for help is a sign of health and maturity, by the way. I would, I think I would, really like in 2022 that we all believe that but i know there's still a stigma with seeking out help and going to get therapy and so forth right a lot of people still think it's like oh you're weak and mm -hmm. fill in the blank but it really isn't it actually means you're mature and you're being responsible um remember this is a journey and a process you will not eliminate fear from your life and as i had kind of stated before it's not possible and i don't think it would be wise Fear does serve a purpose in which it's when it gets out of control and it's being fed by all these other wounds that we need to address. That's when it's not helpful. Here's some resources, just a few. Um, if you need a therapist, this is just an idea, by the way, there's other ways to go about this, but psychology today, a lot of us are listed on there. Okay. You can find a therapist. That's one way to find a therapist crisis text line. If you know that you're in crisis or you know someone else that is, they are available 24 seven. You just text them and they will immediately connect you with a crisis um, counselor. 
suicide prevention line. If you have any thoughts of you not, do not feel safe with yourself, you're thinking about hurting yourself, or you know someone else that is, the suicide prevention line, that's exactly what they're there for, okay? So I just want you to have those resources in your pocket too, because you just never know. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys so much. Thank you.